Hi, I'm Martin. I'm Helen. I'm John. Welcome to the Other Worlds podcast. Uh, we're here again. John, uh, you're back from... We, we did some videos with you some, while, uh, some time ago, two years ago. John is joining us again. Thank you. It's much appreciated. But he's joining us because we're going to talk about something I, or something I think we're all kind of fans of, which is the world of Bioware. Um, and specifically Bioware and, in, and their games. So obviously video games, not something people will always uh, think of writers or associate with writers when they come about. But there is a lot of writing to do with video games. Uh, would you guys Absolutely. agree? Absolutely. Yeah. Definitely Bioware sort of stuff as well. I mean, when I had a look through, what I saw was you've got your world building, you've got uh, character creation, you've got all those dialogue bits you hear. So when you, when you run up to a character or as you're walking through the world, you hear bits of text and bits of dialogue. There's that. This is like flavour text when you read a scroll or you read a this, that and the other, and the descriptions of weapons even. Yeah. And there's also obviously your big scripted cutscenes and the trailers and what have you. So, as I say, we're going to talk about Bioware games, but first, I wonder whether there's any games that you guys think are notable, good, bad, or, you know, in between, or maybe odd games or unique games that show good levels of writing or show bad levels of writing equally. Well, given the fact that we're talking about video games and storytelling, the thing that immediately occurs to me, I can't remember the name of the developer, there was a French developer who many, many moons ago said that the future of video games was narrative. Mm. And he came out with a game which in the UK was called Fahrenheit. Yes. I think I've played that vaguely. It started out with a perfectly ordinary person who finds himself apparently possessed and compelled to murder someone and then he's on the run. And then he's investigating what's actually happened to him whilst being pursued by the authorities during what appears to be the worst winter in, in record ever. And it turns out to be a somewhat mystical, somewhat science fictional, apocalyptic story. Mm. Very confusing writing in some places, very French, mm. but very interesting. And I think the developer was absolutely right, even if we look at games that are simple shooters now. Narrative is considered key. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's no doubt that games do seem to be progressing towards that. And I think uh, the Bioware games that we're going to talk about, specifically Dragon Age, uh, the, the franchise of Dragon Age and the franchise of Mass Effect, I think there's there's so much writing in those franchises, and they have, they do, they they stood out to me. I mean, I don't know about you guys, whether you think they, they stand out in the same way. Uh, for me, it was. <sighs> There's books, there's films, there's games, there's everything going on with Bioware. What is it, do you think then, I mean, do you, is there something that you guys particularly enjoy about those? Because I know what character. I think. Yeah. Character Definitely is... character. Um, if you look at, for instance, the Morrowind series, the Elder Scrolls series, you've got all this open world gameplay, you've got well-drawn environments, you've got people talking about how they used to be an adventurer once until they took an arrow in the knee. Uh, you've got all of these things, but what you don't have is a great deal of character development mm -hmm. and more to the point, the background characters, the NPCs being sufficiently well developed that you as the player feel like you're, you're creating a relationship with them. Bioware excels in inviting the player to immerse themselves in the world and develop relationships with the characters, not just the romances, but friendships. One of the reasons why Garrus, for instance, is so popular in the Mass Effect mm -hmm. franchise. Yeah. Uh -huh. Same again, really, because um, going again back to Elder Scrolls, they do the setting very well and the world building, but it falls, it, you can't really get invested in it because the characters aren't there as your introduction mm -hmm. to it. You've got no real stake in it because the characters don't make you feel like you're invested. Yeah. Bioware, on the other hand, they're, they're my go-to for good storytelling, good characterization, because, again, like you were saying, it's just, you can really get a connection with these characters and you can feel like they've got a genuine story and personality. Mm. So. One thing that occurs to me immediately would be Ashley Williams in the Mass Effect series, for instance, the notorious space racist. Um, and yeah, there she is, this big tough marine, sole survivor of a squad and it turns out she's the eldest of a girly horde she's the big sister mm. uh, with a penchant for poetry 
particularly Tennyson, if I remember correctly. Mm. And yet, when we get to Mass Effect 3, when we haven't really seen much of Ashley for a while, we have a call back to that when she recites a couple of lines from Invictus. Mm -hmm. And it's just that lovely cohesion, it's that consistency, it's that sense of, yes, I know this person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this person has aspects of them that are surprising and things that are familiar from previous meetings. It's, it's, it's really good for making you feel immersed in a real living environment with real living people even though you blatantly know it's not mm. there on the screen. Yeah. Like the, each character has their own voice which mm. m in a lot of games you can't really find. It's true. I, I think we mentioned in the last podcast about uh, Morrigan and uh, Alistair. Alistair yeah. There's that wonderful uh, banter that goes on between them and y you hear sort of drops like that. Uh, do you think then that sort of the the writing that goes into those, there is clearly a lot of writing that goes into that. Do you think that well, adds to our enjoyment? I do, and just as an example of how much writing, uh, I think Patrick Weeks, one of the, now the head writer for Bioware, uh, for Dragon Age, sorry, uh, he said that for just the main party members, they can they can have up to like a million words just for them. <laughs> wow. That's not counting the, co the codex or the journal. Yeah. That is just their dialogue. That's how much effort goes into those main characters. That's not even the the, the person you play, well, that's that your party members. That will cover, for instance, in the first Mass Effect, whether or not you encourage Garrus down or a Renegade Path or a Paragon Love Path, mm. whether or not you pursue romance options or don't pursue romance options, whether you pursue the loyalty quests. So you've got this branched narrative, all of which needs to be scripted. Mm. Yeah. It's an enormous task. Yeah. I mean, one thing talking about Bioware, uh, when the Old Republic came out, they'd had a team, I believe, of 12 writers working solidly on the Old Republic for two years. Mm -hmm. I, as I said, it's something I found quite interesting. Uh, when I was looking for topics that we could talk about on the podcast, it was it's clear that there's a lot of writing in there, and I don't think, even I hadn't realised that a million words, it's fantastic just to think <laughs> of that. And people don't always associate writing with with video games no. it's you know you sometimes the image is people sitting there at a computer coding away doing whatever it is they do or maybe people drawing some lovely art um i mean obviously writers aren't in every part of the, of the game development process mm -hmm. but we we keep talking about dragon age, Ma age and mass effect and Perhaps one of the reasons we do that is because structurally they're quite similar. Yes. You do have those great big vast stories, hopefully, in, in some cases. Dragon Age 2 perhaps a little less vast than yeah. the rest of the series. Um, but you've also got that, that those really deep world, deep characters and deep worlds. You get a feeling like, I know that person. That is a, That feels like a real person, you know. Mm. You get you talk to one person in the right way and you go back to and maybe talk to your romance option and... They they're annoyed with you because you've got you're they're jealous because they you've gone talking to somebody else and I think that's that's a testament to just how well these franchises are written. Uh, are there any moments that you, that have made you I, either of you go back and go or, or just stop for a minute and go wow that was that was pretty good. It's pretty consistent I would say in both of those games. I mean you mentioned the banter between Morrigan and Alistair mm. in Dragon Age. Uh, you've got, oh, the Quinari. Yes. yes. Some of the interactions with the Quinari, particularly in Dragon Age 2. Yeah. And when you get to the depths of the mysticism and you look at the civilization and casual barbarity mm. ensconced within the culture. Um, some of the humour from Garrus. Mm. Yeah. Again. Yeah. He's a very entertaining character when he, for instance, Mass Effect 3, when they're on the top of the Presidium and Shepard suggests that they, you know, he, they maybe jump in, go for a swim, and he describes what Turian swimming actually looks like. <laughs> you, you, yeah. These games are replete with moments like that, and every one of those moments is the work of a writer yeah. Yeah. sitting there dreaming, creating. It's, it's, it's beautiful. I know with the Dragon Age series, I won't go into too much detail because this is from the latest DLC of, in of Inquisition, so spoilers. But there are several reveals that we get in the Descent DLC surrounding the Deep Roads and 
the creature that we call the Titans. Mm -hmm. And then in Trespasser DLC, regarding the elven mythology and their creators, their gods, the, I was just sat there just like, what have I just seen? Because it it's such a big twist, but also it fits in that world because the thing with Bioware and Mass Effect both is that their journals or codex or whatever, yeah. they're often in universe perspective. Every piece of information we get is through the filter of, of a character's eyes. So we don't actually know what we're get, if what we're getting is true. It's yeah. a complete mm -hmm. unreliable narrator. Yeah. Which, by, particularly with Dragon Age, I've noticed is that they use that to very good effect to lie to their audience yeah. and lead us on a completely different path. And then they can hit us at the end with like, actually, no, this is what we actually think is going on. Here you go, off that. Do you not think, though, that's a bit more rewarding in that yes. it almost feels to some extent like you have uncovered the truth yourself? Yes. yes. It's, it's almost like That's precisely why it's written in that fashion. Yeah. yeah. Uh, very much like a, a writer of murder mysteries will often drop in clues, but try not to make it too obvious that they're yeah. feeding information to the reader so that the mm. reader can go, I think it's this, I think it's this, and when it's revealed, yes, it's this, I'm so glad. Yeah. Yes. It feels good. It's a murder mystery kind of thing, of, yeah. or, or that, that old joke about, you know, Sixth Sense. You already knew who's dead, you know, it's, it's, that, kind of, it's that kind of stuff. So. Maybe we should look a bit more at the world, um, or the worlds that feature in these games. The Obviously the graphic design, the concept, art, that kind of thing will play some part in developing the world. But kind of like a theatre show or a film, everything is part of one big hole. You know, if yeah. you're a costume designer and you're scuffing up a costume in a certain way, you're doing that because that costume needs to tell a story. Everything works together in that kind of way. What role do you think that the writers play in creating or developing these worlds? Any, and I'm not just talking about the core games themselves. Perhaps the other aspects of the franchise, so films or books or, or what have you outside. I think it's probably largely a symbiotic relationship. On the one hand, the writers have to develop a internally consistent and cohesive world. They have to make it sufficiently different as to provide a hook, uh, so that it doesn't necessarily feel like somewhere the player has been before. They come up with the ideas, those ideas go to the concept artists. The concept artists then start drawing. Mm. And frequently the writers will then see these drawings and be further inspired by them mm -hmm. and perhaps suggest little tweaks or perhaps start taking an aspect of the world building in a direction they hadn't previously considered. Uh, Tachanka, all those statues that are partially broken. Mm. Uh, I would imagine something like that was probably pretty powerful the first time the writer saw it. Mm. Yeah, I see that. I mean, do you think then, I mean, both Dragon Age and Mass Effect, they, they tell these kind of sequential stories. Uh, I, I don't know about you guys, I think it's kind of a credit to the people who initially created these worlds, mm. that there are people able, as, as writers, to come in and go, OK, I can now write a short film or I can write a series of web videos or even uh, novellas. Do you think that those writers have it a bit easier perhaps in, in starting though their, their work or how do you think they help to develop the world that exists? I don't know how much you guys have, have sort of gone into the, the expanded universe for lack of a better word. But Yeah, um, I personally have not watched like there was a Dragon Age Dragon TV Age Redemption. series. Yeah. Yeah. I've personally not watched that, um, but I've kind of read up on it, know a bit yeah. about it. Uh, there was a plot device or feature in that called The Mask of Fen Harrell, mm -hmm. which when the TV series came out, it was like, oh, okay, cool, cool bit of, you know, yeah. it's a MacGuffin. Then we get further into the DLC and in when Inquisition came out in particular, and we realised, actually, that might be more important than we first thought, yeah. because they introduced an aspect of... Uh, the world in something that people might not even see, like mm. I didn't. But yeah. we, they do it in a way that, well, if we don't watch it, we don't really miss anything. Um, but it introduces the concept more than the item itself, because the item isn't really important. Mm. Uh, two so. quick things on that. For those who don't know, or perhaps don't know, hopefully if you're writers and you're listening to this, you should know. If you're not a writer, a MacGuffin is something that uh, the characters pr really chase after regardless of any other motivations they might have uh, yeah, yeah. or any other regards to the plot. It's, it's it's there to be chased. Yeah. The other thing is, uh, for me, 
I did watch that and I actually I enjoyed that. There were two things about that I absolutely loved. But one of those perhaps was the idea that um, it gave me the hints that there's something older. There's so, with the elves, there is there is clearly something more there, yeah. and it just it helped build that for me a bit more. It, it with, was with, the experience. With yeah, there, there's something you because the mask is is basically a way to open the open the fade, uh, and that was if that belongs to the elves, there's something about the elves' heritage we still haven't seen. Mm. And that was between one and that was between origins two and, and two or no two um, and that came out after two I believe it was between two and three because yeah. Talis who was the main character in Redemption was a DLC DLC yeah. character for uh, Mark of the Assassin two. yeah, yeah. Uh, John I mean are there any moments in novel in the novels or companion stuff that you that you found interesting or well, I mean, it, it does. It generally deepens the experience. The novels of Mass Effect in particular, you get to see David Anderson as a youngster. You get to see his relationship with Kaylee Sanders, which is only really hinted at in Mass Effect 3. Mm-hmm. Uh, Saren, as a good guy-ish. Pre-indoctrination, anyway. Mm. Um, and you possibly get aspects of, for instance, living on the wards on the Citadel, you've got the possibly more of an impression of the bustle, the scents, yeah. all the alien cosmopolitan food stops. Uh, but then again, a lot of these narratives are going multimedia. We've got uh, the main game you play on your PC or on your console, and then you've got a side game you play on your phone via an app. Mm. Uh, which may or may not interact with the console game yeah. as you go, I, or introduce characters such as Miranda Lawson. Uh, you've got your novels, you've got your webisodes, mm-hmm. um, and you know you've even at this point you've even got your cinema. For instance, Assassin's Creed is about to get its first movie. As which... is Warcraft. Yeah. And uh, Halo have had quite a few as well. Yeah, but the the thing about Assassin's Creed is it is very explicitly set in the same world as the games. Mm. It just happens to be in a time period that we haven't previously explored. I, I, believe I could be wrong in saying this. I do think, I, I think Warcraft is likely to be as well. Uh, I'm trying to think who developed Warcraft now. I should know this off by heart. Um... No, help. Anybody? <laughs> I don't know. Blizzard. Blizzard Entertainment. That's it. Blizzard Entertainment. Um, <laughs> it took me a while then. Uh, <laughs> they uh, they kind of have followed that through and, and there is a bit more with that. But, uh, well, okay. Let's perhaps move on a bit then to, with, with these huge franchises and with so many writers working on these projects, given that one writer can create an inc- or can, can fall into the trap of leaving inconsistencies about in their work... Have you guys noticed any inconsistencies, or do you think that uh, there are many inconsistencies and maybe any way that they could be avoided by the writers, or are they kind of inevitable with so many writers working on one project? I can't say that I have seen any inconsistencies in the Mass Effect, uh, Mass Effect franchise or in the Dragon Age franchise. Having said that, I consider myself to be l- less familiar with the Dragon, Dragon Age franchise. Mm. Uh, the reason behind that, I would say, is because you've got a team of writers working on the world building, checking each other's work, mm. deliberately kicking holes in it where they make mistakes, presumably, and then establishing a very well-drawn-up Bible, i.e. the Codex, yeah. yes. for which uh, all of the writers uh, have as reference. Yes. Which, talking about the the notion of being a writer coming into one of these franchises, on the one hand, is a huge boon. You know all about the world very quickly. Perhaps limita- uh, limitations in as much as you, you are less free to create mm-hmm. new things. But overall, I'd say the level of, of consistency with these worlds has been very, very high, certainly with Bioware. Mm. I mean, they've also got a whole team of editors as well. It's not just the writers yeah. in the writer's pit and then they're the only ones responsible for the writing. No, it's, they send all their work off to their own editors, like it's the whole team of editors who will then go through with the fine tooth comb and say, of course. yeah, Mr. this Bear. has done that, yeah. yeah. There you go, let's go fix that. So there's, I think there's going to be like minor little things that they will miss. That Canary between Dragon Age Origins and 2, but that's more of an art that direction, was, art was, style yeah. issue. They that, actually wanted to about. have the Canary to have horns in Origins, but they couldn't, because they, they'd have to wear helmets, they mm. couldn't, 
get the... They couldn't work out how to do the mesh. How to do that, yeah. yeah. So for two, they were able to get round that by that point. But uh, also with the Kunari. Um, there was something I was, going, I was going to say then. It's gone out my head. It happens, unfortunately. <laughs> I'm going back to it later, if need be. Uh, no, yeah, no. it's gone. Okay. <laughs> Well, I tell you what. Let's let let's uh, move forward then a bit. Uh, to you mentioned something actually, John, the Bible, and this is something I think as writers we're all kind of familiar with. And uh, having looked at writing academically through university or, or what have you, we we come to know about the Bible. Perhaps we should again explain, like we did with MacGuffin, for those who don't know what a Bible is. So for every TV show, so long running soaps, perhaps uh, particularly, there's a great one I love, which is the one created for Battlestar, the miniseries. I think that's a wonderful one. But a Bible tends to be a collection of information about the world. So these these are the current characters. These are the world we're setting in. These are the types of things characters do and do not do. Uh, is there anything I'm missing with that? Uh, it's basically, it's literally every piece of information you could ask for that is going to be in, it's like an encyclopedia in a way. Uh, yeah, technology levels, magic systems, beliefs and deities, so what, particular yeah. religions around mm. those deities. Things that the players are allowed to know, but things that, for example with Bioware, they have said from the start, we are never going to show you whether the maker is real or not. No. That's just one thing that is, you know, that is up to you whether you, seeing what we've like, seen in the games, whether you believe that it, that's a thing or mm -hmm. not. So they've also got the things that are going to be revealed to the player later on in the series, things that are never going to be revealed, etc. So it's yeah. it's about what to show, what not to show. Yeah. This is what you can do, this is what you can't do. And yeah. it, it exists, correct me if I'm wrong guys, but it exists with that exa exact purpose of a new writer coming into it will be given this big document. I'm, I keep imagining it as this big box file. I actually printed off the, the Battlestar one I'm talking about, which is freely available on the web. I don't know whether it's meant to be freely available on the web, but it's <laughs> like 50, 60 pages full, yeah. two hours worth of content. And it goes fairly in depth of like, they cannot go, you know, there's a, they can't do they can't do fast and light travel other than jumping, which is essentially the ship decide, goes into this thing and it in two places once it's quantum entanglement. So it decides at one point which point it wants to be in so i'm going from you know point one to its destination point they are the ship actually exists in both points at the same time and then chooses to be in one or the other that is something that actually that comes in quite useful to a writer because they will mm -hmm. then know okay so i can't have this magical new ship coming in from nowhere that can just use warp drive because yeah. that doesn't exist in that universe similarly i would imagine with the dragon age as you said you know you don't you can't ever say Dink, the maker is definitively real you can't yeah. ever say this is what happens, or there will be guidelines and timed releases, I would imagine, for that. Yeah. So, for those who don't know, uh, I'll probably put some links or some information in the description about, or even an annotation somewhere, about what a Bible is and where you can find stuff like that, because that's quite an interesting thing for writers who haven't heard of it, perhaps, before. Um, if we move on, or if we move to sort of characters, perhaps, because one of the things that interests me, or that hooked me into the to the Bioware worlds, was the characters. Mm. They are so in-depth, and they, as we said before, there are those moments where you go, I know that person. Mm. I know that person through and through. They do feel quite real to you, and they do react. They yeah. react to, it, it, you know, ongoing events and what have you. Uh, do you feel the same as writers? Do you feel like the characters are written and help you draw... Uh, become drawn into the world yeah they're the main hook really because they're the they're the ones that you meet usually pretty much straight away and they're the ones who are there with you throughout mm. as your kind of familiarity in a way particularly as the games get stranger or more ex more expanded mm -hmm. they're your constant throughout the game yeah um i mean you can always change that with some characters you can drive them off if they get too annoyed with you things like that but they are the main kind of draw for the, for the protagonist to actually have an investment in the world. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that particular mechanic goes back all the way to Baldur's Gate. Yeah. Um, whereby you, 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 if you behave in a certain fashion, you may actually lose characters mm. in your party whom you would rather keep hold of. You may even be forced to kill them. Um, well, there's, there's an example of that. I don't know whether you guys have ever played it. It's, it was an interplay game and a rather early one that I absolutely adore called Stonekeep. When it was released, when you actually bought it back in the 90s, you didn't just get the game. You got with the bo in the box a full novella hmm. called Thera's Awakening. Um, I won't go into the actual game itself or any of the information, but you do have things, similar things back then 
of characters who are constantly commentating. So there's a there's a fairy realm that you can go to. If you go to it at the wrong time, you lose one of the characters forever. They just disappear. They, they will not go into the fairy realm. There is another one who is a dwarf who just hates how sickly sweet this entire fairy realm is. And you've got this twangly, lovely, fairy, sweet music in the background and what have you. And it, 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 so it, it's been in video games for a while, but mm. I think it's been somewhat... Enhanced. minor yeah. and I think now we're getting to that point where people are going actually we want more out of the games we're paying 50, 60 quid for a game we want more content we want we want to see that it's worth it you know you don't want a 90 minute game when you're paying 50 quid because no. you may as well go to the movies for that yeah yeah or buy a DVD or what have you you want that kind of replayability factor in games now yeah particularly with the, the amount we're, play, we're paying well, which is why you've got multiple characters who are all drawn up very well, despite the fact that you will only ever deploy a small party nine yeah. times out of ten. Yeah. Uh, so that you can play the game with, okay, last time I didn't use Alistair and Morrigan, this time I will use Alistair yes. and Morrigan. Yeah. Yeah. And we're back. Sorry about that, folks, uh, if you're watching, but uh, we had things to check technically. Sorry about that. Anyway, um, you brought up a nice point, though, about you can play through different ways and you can bring in new characters or you can play with characters you didn't play with before. Should we also then make particular mention of the dialogue options that you can choose? So we've already yeah. talked about companion dialogue a bit and how you get those prejudices and whatever, which for me is one of the beautiful things about it. But you've also got the dialogue options, which are fairly common in games now. Mm. You know, as you said, this does hark back to kind of Baldur's Gate and other similar games. But... Uh, what can we learn from those different options? Do you think there's anything as writers of any kind of genre that we can learn from all these different options that exist within games, uh, specifically the dialogue act, uh, options that characters choose? Well, it helps um, with you determine different voices you can write in because I was watching a podcast from the, one of the Bioware writers and they actually said... One of the questions was, you know, what what's your applicants for for jobs in in Bioware? You know, what what's the kind of criteria if there's any? Mm. And they were saying the reason that a lot of people don't get the job for writing specifically is because even though they might be able to write beautiful prose and they can do great stories and characters, they cannot write in a non-linear fashion. Yeah, that is one of the fallen points, particularly for Bioware games when they have so many branching dialogue mm. and story trees. So that he's saying that. Um, like for that, you need to be able to determine different voices so you give them different options to say in a different way. Also, yeah. if you want to ask questions, some people just want to go straight through the story, get through dialogue quick as you can. Others want to get every little detail, so they will have a ream of questions you can ask. So the, any writers for that need to be able to think of the different things that different characters would want to ask or want to find out. Sure. Um, so they need to be able to do that, but also keep track of there were specific voices and keep the voices consistent all the mm. way through. Same with characters. Also, in terms of non-linear writing, you've got to be able to think in terms of, for instance, the Witcher franchise is notorious for this. Yeah. Decision trees, whereby a particular decision will lead to a particular event or circumstance three, four, five hours later in the gameplay, when it is far too far in the future to conveniently go back to your earlier save mm. and make a different decision just so that there is a sense of consequence. Mm. Well, I mean, let's be clear here, though. We, you can get that to some extent within Dragon Age. The decisions you make, specifically in Dragon Age 2, the decisions you make early on in that first act will affect what happens to your sibling. Yes. yes. Uh, specifically, if, if, they are, if, this, if your sibling is a mage, that... that can be affected by choices you make in, in Act 1 and by the time you get to to the end of Act 1 you may, you know, that may have been 3-4 hours so that, it's yeah. not like it doesn't happen in Bioware but perhaps it's a bit more... It's a bit more immediate with some of them. Yeah. The, the only one from Dragon Age 2 that I can think of that has lasting consequence is the choice you make in character creation whether you yourself are a mage or yeah. or not because that affects what, what, what sibling survives. You, you, did, you yeah. did also, as, as you say though, you also got a rather immediate one in origins where depending on who you created depending on how you start you had a whole host, host of, of different, different start areas different options it's kind yeah. of yeah their own separate story for the for the yeah. starting point and it, that, that's very much equally mass effect 2 uh who will survive the end mission is largely determined by whose loyalty you managed to gain and whose loyalty you managed to keep mm. much earlier in the game so if you have a playthrough whereby, for instance, Thane dies in the suicide run, mm. 
it is not as simple as simply going back to an earlier save and making sure you do Thane's loyalty quest mm -hmm. because it might be determined by whether or not you lost Miranda's loyalty when she and Jack yeah. have an argument. Yeah. So that it, it does take place in the Bioware games. I think uh, the reason I mentioned The Witcher was because they were the first ones to really look at planting the decision here and making sure that the Consequences payoff yeah. came off oh, yeah, later. Yeah. Um, but I do think that's a, a key skill. Also, just the, the notion of being able to take characters down multiple character arcs. Mm. Um, well... Uh, I mean, we may end up revisiting games and what have you. We are getting a bit tight for time, so perhaps we should start wrapping it up. Mm -hmm. um, so, what I'll ask you guys to finish then is, do you think there is anything, or are there things that other game designers or writers could learn from playing through and through experiencing the Bioware, the, the worlds that Bioware have created in their, in their franchises of Dragon Age and, and Mass Effect? I would say the importance of character and the importance of characterization and customization mm. in particular. But Bioware excel in these areas. One of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in a computer role playing game was standing on a hillside in Skyrim watching the Aurora Borealis. That was a marvelous little moment, and yet the game wasn't as adhesive mm. because the characters and the overall sense of char character and story arc weren't mm. there. Uh, the Witcher, beautiful to look at, excellent narrative, well-drawn characterization, but mm. there is no real flexibility or customization yeah. within the character itself. Mm. And I think any game that relies on narrative could certainly do better to, yeah. to pull in and keep hold of their players by learning those lessons. Mm. Uh, again, just looking at possibly if you want, if you're going to write for an unreliable narrator, look at these two because they know very well how to trick the audience, mislead them, it, but in a way that isn't just blatant. Oh no, you're wrong here. It's, yeah. They they make it in a way where we can tell. Okay, this is a possibility. This is a strong possibility, but I wouldn't be surprised if it turned out to be something different. So either they don't do it in a way to get the fans annoyed. Mm. Um, so. Instead, it's that moment of. Oh, oh, that's what's going on. That's exactly yeah. it. Um, so, unreliable narrator is also a very good thing to okay. for those. I, on the back of that, uh, I think I'd say about the same as you, John. Um, it, you can have the most beautiful looking game in the world, but if you haven't got the writing behind it to back it up, it isn't. You know, it's going to fall flat. It's Skyrim was kind of a real good example of that. Uh, yeah, beautiful game. You, no one can really contest well, that's that. Gorgeous. I, I was about the to story say the story is just it's. And yes, yes. I, I would also argue Fallout 4 is that way because you are stuck with a character whose sole motivation is to chase after their son mm. and that is it it's, it's a lot less flexible as an RPG there are some wonderful things you can do in Fallout 4 but as an RPG it kind of sucks a little you, can't, you don't have the flexibility to really role play that character um, but you can actually see a good example of this story as well in another game which is Papers Please which is a fantastic way of um showing you that you can be corrupted very, very easily through making very simple decisions. It has that multiple endings, but it's all kind of 8-bit graphics or 16-bit yeah. graphics, and so the graphics kind of aren't really important. What is important is the story that you're telling and, and the investment you get. Quickly before we wrap up at this time, um, if you want to practice non-linear uh, writing, there is an app that um, Patrick Week has kind of mentioned in, in this podcast called Twine. Twine. Uh, um, Basically, it's very simple, but it allows you to map out all these different um, decision trees, de decision trees, and okay. also bottleneck them and then branch out again. Marvelous. So that's a way to kind of practice if you want to. Well, uh, we'll find the link for that and we'll and pop that in, in, in the, the description. description yeah. Okay. Well, for now, uh, we will wrap up. Thank you if you have been for listening and watching. Um, yeah, we will be back again soon with another episode. For now, though, if you can like, comment, uh, review us on YouTube, uh, subscribe, obviously that would help. That would all help. Uh, you can also email us questions. If you have any questions or topics you'd like us to discuss, uh, email podcast at twfproductions.co.uk. Links are in the description. But for now, thank you. I've been Martin. I've been Helen. And I've been John.
What was that? Post? Yeah, I think something's fallen off. Ah, don't worry about it, mate. Oh, yeah, I know what it'll be. Don't worry about it.